Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com takes a look at the major markets. It was a bumpy ride, especially for Apple. He also takes a look at the U.S. and Canadian dollars. Market historian Bob Hoy gives us his unique view on the markets and how what is happening today compares to what's happened in the past. Is a universal guaranteed income a good idea? Publisher of the realestatetiming.com newsletter, Robert Campbell, reports from San Diego. Are Californians really abandoning the state? He also has some health and investment tips for us. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Magazine CEO Larry Ray and from Golden Arrow Resources Vice President Brian McEwen. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Always good to be with you, Jim. Pretty choppy week on the equity markets. What's the story there? Yeah, uh, sort of a thrashing around. You know, well, a week ago we said uh, that, uh, you know, this is the the bubble that we saw in the precious metals it was followed by the consolidation that we were probably going to see something similar to that in the equity market. So, you know, here we are. I think we, uh, after topping back in the 1st or 2nd of September, the market broke hard into the 8th uh, and has just been thrashing around since then. Of note, um, the uh, our model that looks at volatility in the stock market, uh, it's sort of a, it's using VIX, uh, the volatility index, together with uh, some other measurements, and uh, that created a uh, an extreme on VIX on the 8th of September, and uh, we've got maybe 20, 22 of these signals in the last 20 years, and the typical action. Out of that is that you will get a pretty good rally out of uh, out of the signal, usually within 24 or 48 hours. Uh, in this case, the S and P and the Dow only managed to retrace just under 50 percent of the break. And when we look back, this type of a signal, when you get such a minor reaction off of uh, high volatility, it the implication is that you're going to have a second wave of selling. So. Uh, in this case, the uh, the first break in the S and P uh, had that say 42, 43 percent bounce, and as of Thursday, Friday, market's starting to come unglued again. We're looking for the S and P to have a s- second leg down that's equal to the first one, so that's going to take us down to roughly the 3150 level on the S and P. Closed off the week at 33 and a quarter. So uh, there's some vulnerability here in the short term. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens as it gets down towards that measurement because we are, we're, you know, clearly just in the heart right now of the seasonally weak period that would normally take into uh, October and sometimes through into November. So um, the, the rolling over that we've seen um, in the equity market uh, came from, you know, some really good extremes in August. So it's only natural that you would see this type of move. Gold and silver, are they going to continue to rally or stay put or decline? Uh, well, they have coiled themselves, and so is the U.S. dollar here. Um, since the, um, gosh, the early part of August, if we take a look at it, um, the we're, we're 29 trading days now from the top. And typically um, what happens uh, and with the extremes that we saw in silver and gold you get that first correction back to the 20-day moving average. You bounce back and test the high. Then you come back and retest the low. 
And this whole process usually takes somewhere between 27 and 32 trading days. And if you can't get up through the resistance level, then we have not been able to. Uh, both gold and silver the last uh, week, week and a half, are right against perfect resistance spots. Unless they can pop through that the early part of next week, the probability is that you're going to see a pretty significant 10-day decline on the, um, in, uh, especially in the silver market. Not so much in gold, but silver really has a, a good track record out of this type of a, a rolling top. And if we can get down hard enough, um, you know, we could be looking at some decent buying opportunities, but for now, um, that that resistance of the last uh, week to ten days is pretty formidable, as far as I can see. And you know, we look at the uh, the miners; um, they didn't manage to do much this week. The I guess Kim Ross was the only one. They've reinstituted a dividend after seven years without one. But uh, other than that, uh, most of the other names out there uh, have, are looking a little bit heavy right now. The Canadian dollar, is it surprising that it's still as high as this with uh, crude struggling to keep its head up? Uh, well, actually, uh, we got uh, buy signals early in the week on crude. Uh, sequential nine buy signal on uh, on crude. We got it on the XLE. Those are the, uh, the energy stocks in the state. We've got it on the XEG on the Canadian side. And it looked as though oil should be good for about a 10 to 15 percent rally, and we've gone from 37 and change up to 41 and a half. So percentage-wise, uh, crude oil's had a decent bounce in here. Uh, the CRB index of commodities, uh, same type of action, a good four or five days, and also over on the agricultural side, the DBA uh, had a pretty decent week. However, the Canadian dollar. It did nothing this week. It's stuck here. It's uh, got support, uh, as we've been talking about, at the 75 and a half range, but it really could not get up and do much uh, on the upside. So uh, if, if it continues to underperform, that would be indicative of uh, some pressure around the corner. So um, that's an item we'll be keeping up. Pretty close uh, eye out on. Apple's been a darling on the NASDAQ for a long time, but it looked like it had a big bite out of it. Uh, is Are they going to continue to chew it down to the core? Yeah, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> it's, uh, the, the apple's fallen from the tree at this point. We've got, um, so the, the classic action of the previous four splits was that you would have a, a, a correction of somewhere between uh, 13 and 16 percent, and this one initially was right into that bracket. It was 14 percent, and then it went through a bit of a pause. Uh, the uh, model that we follow uh, in terms of the action on, on Apple here uh, was looking for that sharp run up in August uh, to be a climactic ending action. And um, that's pretty much in place so nicely at this point, and it coincided with the uh, the run up into the split, the four for one split on shares. Now the correction so far, we're down about 23% off the high, sitting around 107, 108, and the norm at this point, from what we can see, would be uh, down to test the 20-week moving average, which is just around $100, so maybe another 7 8% from where we are right now, and uh, look for a bit of basing action in there. But, uh, you know, we've been leery on Apple for the last month and a half, and at this point uh, I think uh, there, there could be some opportunities, but, uh, you know, think in terms of the, the $100 price level as the – first foray into it rather than uh, being uh, too uh, uh, too aggressive uh, presently. Ross, I know you'll have a special offer for us next week, so we eagerly await details on that. Thanks a lot yeah, for well, being on the show. More than welcome. Good to see you. My guest has been Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com. Find him on Twitter at ChartsByRoss. Coming up, Bob Hoy, next on This Week in Money.
Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for ChartsAndMarkets.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Bob. Jim, so good to be with you. Bob, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ have recently hit new highs, but the Dow and Russell 2000 have not. Do you think this is a bullish or bearish sign? This is actually, it shows that the hot action is getting down into fewer and fewer players. And this is what happens. Uh, so, yeah, the lead items have been the S&P and the NASDAQ, because that's where your big high-tech or uh, big cap stocks are. And the determined bulls have been playing uh, the big stocks. So here we are. No, it's it's a sign to be cautious. What do you see ahead for the U.S. dollar short term and long term? Oh yeah, this is really good because the old 1970s uh, inflationists are looking at what the at the Fed has gone crazy reckless, and oh, this is going to put the dollar to zero and gold to fifteen thousand. No, the uh, dollar. The senior currency history is that it goes down in a financial boom and it goes up in the post-bubble contraction. And recently, it looks like the dollar index, the DX, has become oversold and is building a base for a perhaps a really spectacular rally into late in the year. Are we going to have a puny loony or a strong Canadian dollar? <laughs> it's been positive, Jim, with the positive vibrations that came out of the panic in March. But uh, with the commodities and the stock market heading south soon, that would be a, de a decliner for the Canadian dollar. But then there's a chance that there's going to be a change in government from the dreadful minority liberals to a majority conservative government, in which case the, do the Canadian dollar may not get whacked as hard as it would otherwise. What, with all the money printing going on, we're, are we likely to see higher interest rates? Oh, boy, that gets complicated, Jim. Uh, today, in the last two days, the U.S. T-bill rate, three months, has come down. This is a warning on... Uh, a change in this spirited market now. But in history, in post-bubble contractions, t rates go down to zero, the Fed follows, and lesser quality rates like junk bonds, interest rates soar to an immense, to very high things. So it depends where you are on the curve, and it depends where you are in quality. And on quality, that's the difference between high-grade and low-grade bonds, and junk bonds are going to head down in price and to, you know, illiquid items. It's impossible we've seen the highs in gold and silver for a while. Oh, terrific play in these, yes. The gold uh, sector is overbought at about the right time, and uh, we can see a correction for both gold and silver, and in this correction, silver would likely get hit harder than gold. The gold-silver ratio is going to go up again. President Trump ushering in uh, peace in the Middle East. Is this going to affect the price of crude? Oh, yeah, this is a good one, Jim. I think it's the other way around. That the weak crude oil price lessened power of, and finances of all sorts of nasty people in the Middle East than allowing... Uh, Trump's constructive work between the Israel and some of the Arab countries. And I think this uh, constructive work will continue, and it is because of weaker 
crude oil prices. Is the economic devastation we're experiencing due to all the lockdowns comparable to the early 80s? Oh, no. The, the lockdown is without precedent. Uh, it's just been uh, political. They've used uh, a, a severe, it's a severe flu, but they've used uh, another resp- respiratory disease to shut down the global economy. Never been done before. Do you think the lockdowns are really about a virus? Well, that was, we just answered that one. Yeah, it's political in intent. No question about it. There seems to be a push towards socialism, Marxism around the world. Do you think that kind of insanity will create volatile and profitable markets? Oh, yeah. This is what's been going on recently. Very volatile markets. Uh, but with a uh, post-bubble contraction, it'll be a deflation in stocks and bond prices, and it could also be a deflation in the fury and enthusiasms of the left, uh, these two go together. I did a little essay on it a few weeks ago. If people are interested, they can get in touch. If Canada turns Marxist, where could Canadians go to find freedom? Oh, my God, that's out of date. Canada's been Marxist. <laughs> um, there's no place to go. You can't go to the States. So this is where I think you get a popular uprising, a benign popular uprising by the ordinary folk who have had enough government under any label. So I'm looking for a constructive change in politics. Bob, do you think these protests against masks are more about uh, protests about governments interfering in private lives? Oh, there's the professional protesters, Intifa, BLM. And the ordinary public is at the bad end of that. And I think, again, it's another one where the public is going to say, hey, this is nonsense. Shut it down. As the world seems to continue to fall apart, what should investors and speculators be watching for? Well, the change will come to the change in the yield curve. And this is why earlier I mentioned that the decline in the T-bill rate this week could be a sign that the markets are going to deflate. Are the agriculture markets predicting food shortages, higher prices this winter? Not really, but the agricultural index that we follow, maybe about five or six months ago, um, gave a a buy signal. The agricultural prices uh, have been weak for quite a time, and there has been some recovery, but I don't really see a huge move in agricultural prices. Uh, real, our, one of our real estate reporters, Steve Soretsky, tells us that real estate sales for detached homes are up, so are the prices, but uh, condo sales are down, so are the prices. Uh, during this uh, lockdown, partial lockdowns, could this be a sucker's rally for real estate? Yeah, you can get uh, on a great financial boom. One of the features has been uh, is residential real estate prices going up. And then when the deflation comes in, they head down. Uh, the best example, of course, was Florida in the 1920s, and then it was absolutely no bid in the 1930s. Why does law enforcement go along with political suppression of the people in a number of countries around the world? Oh, it's power trip stuff, you know. When you're on a trend of uh, an experiment in authoritarian government, Intuitively, every level, every agency and every department gets on board and goes with it until the public finally has enough and shows it off. Canada has a prorogued government, a new finance minister without a financial background. The province of Alberta sees people there wanting to join the U.S. What are your thoughts on Canada staying together? It's been a hopeless experiment in socialism for far too long. And it's mesmerized the population base in Quebec and Ontario. Uh, But I still think that there is a chance for a benign popular uprising against too much in-your-face and in-your-wallet government in Canada. Do you think Canada should do what Iceland did when the politicians caused a financial crisis there? They arrested all of them and threw them in jail for causing financial ruin to their country. No, you, you, 
<laughs> being stupid is not criminal. <laughs> and also, remember the line, you can't... So... You can't legislate stupidity. You can you can legislate stupidity, but you can't fix the stupidity. Yeah, exactly. Do you think Canada and the U.S. are likely to balkanize uh, the, the yeah, Northeast? Yeah, a term for moving towards regionalism. And, and when you've been in the last 120 years, we have been of an experiment in authoritarian government. It's, it moves collectively where... Uh, they're all trying to put it under the United Nations. And uh, one of the things about previous reforms, it has been in favor of the sovereignty of the individual and the concept. La wait for it, Jim. Limited government. And this is what we're going to head to. The left will use this term balkanize as a, as a condemnation, but no, it, let's call it freedom. Canada has broken off free trade talks with China. What does that tell us about what's going on? Uh, a little more common sense coming into Canada, if you could imagine it. Does China exert significant influence over foreign governments, especially in the Commonwealth? They're trying to. Like, like uh, Marxists everywhere are always ambitious to force it upon other people. Is President Trump the only leader standing up to China? Trump versus China, who are you betting on? Oh, I think Trump can uh, win against authoritarians, not just in China, but in in the United States as well. Could we be in World War III right now, but instead of having an invasion, it's infiltration? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, it has been an unrelenting war by the bureaucrats upon ordinary society. And the work I've done independently is that each of these long experiments in authoritarian government have lasted for about 125 years. It takes that long to ruin the economy, and then folks, as hardship comes in, say, you experts, you idiots, you're out of here. So I'm, I'm looking for an end to World War III. Is it true every revolution has been started by the middle class? No. Revolutions have been started. You get two kinds of revolutions, Jim. The, the bad ones, the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, where popular dissatisfaction, hardship amongst ordinary people, uh, caused uprisings. And then in those two revolutions... Uh, neurotic intellectuals took a hold of it and turned them into bloodbaths each time. What one wants to look at is the glorious revolution in England in 1688, which was bloodless, and it was ordinary folks showing off the last absolutist king in England. And uh, I think, I'm very optimistic that we can have, po let's call them benign popular uprisings. We'll have more with Bob Hoy when This Week in Money returns. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Bob, are we experiencing the implementations of Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, and what are those? Well, yeah, there, uh, this business of... Uh, this Continuation, you know, uh, everything has to, to be able to be continued and renewed and all that sort of stuff. It's just another lefty, uh, lefty dream. Uh, I think, uh, this can collapse along with all the other schemes as well. Are we living in George Orwell's Animal Farm or his 1984? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Animal Farm is a delightful brief read. 
And the uh, gist of it is that when the control freaks take over, everything gets bad. And as they said, some animals are more equal than others. The pigs are more equal than others. And, uh, yeah, it's a combination of both. Uh, Orwell had uh, was very good at seeing the future. Yes, and I know in 1984 your TV set spied on you. Well, uh, Samsung models have a camera that can tell Netflix when you're not in the room and they'll pause the movie. So, yeah, it's real. <laughs> yes. QAnon is in the headlines. What are you hearing about it? Oh, that's, uh, to my mind, still obscure. It's, a, it's an effective site, and it does come up with some points, but... I'm not a strong backer of the site. What is the U.S. likely to look like on November 4th? Well, the day after the election, it's going to be absolute hellish. I think that Trump can win the Electoral College, the which is what counts. Now, the biggest threat is how many votes the Democrats can steal. Uh, I have it in my mind without scholarship that typically they steal about 2 million votes. And uh, this one, they'll be all out to steal votes. So whether it can be, uh, the franchise can be protected from this, uh, I don't know, but uh, it's much more comfortable to think that Trump can win because voting for Democrats is absolutely irrational. You would have what's going on in Portland in every major city in the United States. So uh, the thought of Democrats winning uh, would be a disaster. Any thoughts on mail-in ballots and voter fraud? That's what it is. Yeah. Are a number of countries across the world likely heading for depression, and how is a depression defined? Yeah, they've got... It's an elusive term. It first appeared, Jim, in 1873 was a great financial bubble and was followed by a severe contraction, and then England was the senior country then. And uh, 1884... The economist looked at the prevailing weakness and called it the Great Depression, and I think that was the first time it was used. Most of the time, um, financial media would say that on a recession, that business was depressed, which is correct. It, it, it didn't have a horse implication. But then with that, and then the next Great Depression, so, but let's call them post-bubble contractions. The first bubble completed in 1720 and was followed by a post-bubble contraction and everyone since 1873, 1929. So this would be the sixth. And this is what we're looking for is a post-bubble contraction that eventually may be called another Great Depression. Some businesses need to pay lower wages to be able to stay in business. What would a universal basic income do to those businesses? Universal basic income is just another socialist concept that would be a, 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 a universal mess. So uh, the best thing on a uh, after a boom is to get the prices down, the prices of all goods and prices of labor, everything down. And then there's a level at which it starts to go back to work. So uh, base, universal basic income is universal basic socialism. Now, I've heard from a lot of pub owners, and I've seen it for myself, that uh, all the people who took the Canadian emergency benefit, the CERB, uh, they haven't returned to work when they've been called, and they've had to hire new staff. Uh, and I'm wondering if you want to encourage people to return to work. How about increasing the personal income tax exemption instead. So uh, you have an incentive to work and make more. Excellent idea, for sure. Are governments in the process of ending free society? Oh, yeah. It's been on. It started out of the middle of nowhere in about 1900. And if a historian then had studied and learned about the previous long experiments in authoritarian government, 
This was the height of proper 19th century liberalism, whereas the sovereignty of the individual was important and limited government was the ideal. And then it began to, so if you understood all of history before that, you would not be able to predict in 1900 that we'd go through another horror show century of intrusion and the ending of free society. So this has been on for a hundred, uh, more than a hundred years, and we're getting to the end of it rather than the start of it. We keep hearing about the threat of mandatory forced vaccines. Do you think that would be re- realistically implemented? They will try, but I think it could become a political point that helps get people moving to protect their own freedom. Bob, you know, there's the theory that the COVID virus was a release from a, a Chinese biological warfare lab. And it's just been released that a Chinese lab accidentally uh, ejected brucellosis uh, bacterium, also known as Malta fever, into the air, infecting at least 3,200 people. Does it sound like the Chinese have a problem with handling dangerous uh, diseases? They, I, I like the news story that came out that it was a virus that was created. Now, whether it got out of the lab intentionally or accidentally, it really doesn't matter, but authoritarians around the world really used it, as, and it may take some time and more research to determine whether the Chinese communists released it on purpose. Yeah, what better way to stop riots, not just in Hong Kong, but in China, by telling people if you go out in public, you could get a deadly disease. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, is population reduction the goal of some very sick and powerful people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They've been around forever. In the early 1900s, uh, when the urge for scientific control of the economy and the public came along, it was just very natural to step out that, oh, we can design a better person. As a matter of fact, the first socialist uh, uh, leader in any state or province in, in North America was Tommy Douglas with the socialists in Saskatchewan. And uh, they were very much, as a matter of fact, he, uh, I think his uh, thesis at university was uh, uh, genetic planning of people. I can't, I can't remember what the hell the name of it was, but yeah. Ambitious socialists then, they were going to control and manage everything and plus improve the breeding stock of people. And of course we know who really did work on that was the Nazis in, in, uh, in Europe when they took control. So sick and powerful people, unfortunately. What would population reduction mean for the markets? Uh, Population reduction would be very slow relative to whatever's going on in the markets. The markets are going to move uh, sooner than there's going to be any effective reduction in population. Is tyranny, lawlessness, and corruption likely to continue for the foreseeable future? No, it's part of our theme that this is... I think it's ending action. Uh, in the uh, Up until 1920, there was a fabulous boom in inflation and commodities and everything and it was also the left got hyperactive and created the Russian Revolution which is a disaster and even American politicians were nationalizing railroads it was crazy so the theme that I have on this Jim is that in a boom everybody gets busy including the left and then in the bust everybody gets unbusy including the left, and I've got a paper on that if anybody's interested, that as this market deflates, so will the political ambition. Why do people willingly give up their freedoms? Oh, it's always an old equation, Jim. Good question. They exchange freedom for security. And the game on the government side is to invent a fear a fear so drastic that oh that the oh, that the only thing that can fix it is the full power of the state 
And so they create an image, a fearful image, and then they're going to ease it. But in order to have your fear reduced, you have to surrender your political freedom to the state. It's it's a very old equation, and I think also at a point where people are going to discover the nonsense of it. And Bob, uh, for our regular listeners uh, to your show, we usually answer listener questions, and we do have one this week that we have time to squeeze in. So here's a question from Mike. Mike, his uh, letter says, That is a great question by Cecil Bob. Many Elliott Wave devotees are seeing a final leg up in the S&P to 4,000 by the end of the first quarter of 2021. Many of them say it will be the top and expect everything to collapse after that, including gold, as the world prepares for the so-called Great Reset. However, other technicians point out that there's a widening topping formation originating back from 2016 that they say will take the equity indexes below the March lows later this year. Bob, I'm technically confused. What is actually (laughs) happening here? I know you're supposed to say indices, but I like to say indexes. Yeah. Oh, first of all, Elliott Wave. Uh, it has many followers and a few leaders in it, but it's far too open for interpretation because I looked at an Elliott guy this morning and on gold, and it was this, this is probable, but then this is probable. Uh, history, when it repeats, is really quite reliable, and everything we see here now is looking quite somewhat like 1929 or 1873, where the U.S. market peaked in September. Then there's also a very old recurring pattern that you have a big commodity boom, and then nine years later you have a huge financial boom. And the first one was the South Sea bubble in 1720, and it was nine years after uh, 1711, which was the big commodity boom. And then we'll just move fast forward to 1920, which was a huge commodity boom. And then the peak was in 1929. Uh, same, 1873 commodities were 1864 and the financial boom, 1873. So then now if you got uh, the charts to the month from a commodity peak, it can be 112, 113, or 114 months to the peak in stocks. So the last high uh, for commodities was in 2011, and it was about 112 months. So this peak in September here could be the equivalent to September 1929 or September 1873. So history itself when you look at the major events, provides a very good path from one big event to the other. And the path is huge boom in commodities. Nine years later, huge boom in financial assets, contraction. And that this is now the sixth time around. So uh, we would urge people not to look at Elliott Wave. And uh, also uh, just poured in another email from Cecil this time. I noticed from your newsletter that you're looking at this market behavior as a correction within an uptrend with similarities to other historical bullish uptrends. Are you expecting just a correction this fall in the scope of a longer uptrend to 2021? Are you, Or are you expecting to test or go below the lows of March 2020 on the S&P and NASDAQ? Good question, So We have a couple of comparisons to make, and uh, my colleague Ross Clark is matching up with previous ones, and this is where you end up looking for a correction in here now, whereas if you're looking at straight history of great financial bubbles, this could turn into uh, the next bear market. And one thing that is really helping with determining where we are on this is one is the timing I said the nine year thing and then the other is the yield curve which is the difference between longer term bonds and short term and last summer it inverted and we have the yield curve back to 1857 
and there's one rule. If you have an inversion, you will get a recession. And this is the recession was said to start in February. The other thing is that in early January, the curve inverted again. So you had this double sort of inversion. And the last time that happened was in 2007. And you know what followed that. And then it happened in 1929. And it happened with the 1873 bubble. And both of those were followed by lengthy contractions. So our work on the credit markets uh, is... It's been very helpful, uh, so I will stay with the view that uh, really terrific technical excesses were reached during the summer on a number of series. Um, in you also had a, like lumber went crazy, and you've had the action in credit markets and craziness in bond markets. So hey, it's been party time and. Often, if there's going to be a, a setback, it will happen in the fall. Uh, so this is what we're looking now. I think uh, my own view, to answer Cecil's question, is I think this hit to the market is leading to a bear market in the in both for sto- both stocks and bonds. And for people who just listen to This Week in Money, Bob does talk to us on a regular basis every Friday. He really loves answering your questions, like we heard uh, from Nick and uh, Cecil, or Cecil. <laughs> we don't know. But uh, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Bob, thank you so much for being on the show. Jim, it was good to be with you, and look forward to the next one. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy, the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. Coming up, Robert Campbell, next on This Week in Money. Value from success, growth, and discovery. Golden Arrow Resources is a well-funded gold copper exploration company with proven management and prospective properties in Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. Golden Arrow trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol GRG, on Frankfurt, symbol G6A, and the OTCQB, symbol GARWF. For more information, visit us at goldenarrowresources.com or call Sean at 778-686-0135. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Robert Campbell, author of the Timing the Real Estate Market and also the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter online at realestatetiming.com. He's speaking to us from San Diego. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Bob. And do you have that forest fire smoke like we do here in Vancouver? Nope. Nope. That's, we have our fires here in San Diego. So they're brush fires, but we haven't had any of those this year. And, um, but I do, you can see the smoke is, is in the air because a couple of days ago in the afternoon sky, it was kind of hazy and I didn't know whether it was coastal fog or what it was, but the image of the sun was shining through, Jim, and it looked like an orange. <laughs> well, here so in I Vancouver. Think it was some smoke in there, yes. you know what I mean? Yeah, see, all the smoke is blowing up to Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you so just. Said, wow. Well, I didn't even think about it at that time. I go, that's unusual. Normally, you don't see the, the sun kind of shines. This was like a friggin' like like uh, like Mars or something right up in the sky. Yeah, well, here it's like a snowstorm. It's just white. It's a white wall outside my yeah, window. We missed it. We, we're not. So you know, we have our we, hey, fires are part of our life down here too. But they're brush fires. We don't have any trees. Well, yes. We're, we're desert. We, we only get. Th- 15, 13 inches, you know, it, this, we would be a desert. We'd be like Baja, California without water, Tom, without water. Bob, you just published the latest edition of the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter. What's in it, and how can people subscribe to it? Well, the yes, I did. The September 15th issue, I publish six times a year. I mean, just, so, just to, to let you know how to, how to uh, take a look at it uh, before I tell you some things about it. Uh, you can go to my website at realestatetiming.com. Just like it sounds, no dot, dashes, realestatetiming.com, and, and it'll, you can read a sample issue and learn more about what I do. But the latest issue that ha- was probably one of the hardest I've had to write in a lot of years, and, um, and probably one of the, one of the best too. 
for this reason that I am that I'm driven by data 100%. I created a timing model based on five key indicators that is right 80 to 90% of the time. And obviously, I lean on that model real hard in making uh, intelligent buy and sell decisions because it's right so much. Well, two of the key indicators in that model are notice of defaults and foreclosure sales. Gee, guess what? There's there's no integrity to that data nowadays because of the moratorium on on foreclosures. You can't foreclose. So all of a sudden, normally you're coming along so it's artificially low, so I can't even use it. So now with my timing letter, I have to base it on the other three indicators and use my brain and study history. And my brain goes back a long way, for those of you that don't know me. I mean, I was, uh, I'm 73 years old, and I was born on a building site. My dad was a builder. I was born with a skill saw in my hand. So I've been around this fabulous real estate slash real estate and real estate development business almost my entire life. So I know the cycles. So now you've got to lean on experience. I'd much rather lean on, on um, pure data, my timing model. But, you know, sometimes, like we've talked about all the time, sometimes plan A um, doesn't work the way it always should. Right, Jim? We've heard the coronavirus panic referred to as a pandemic. Some also call it a hoax. How much damage has the COVID-19 narrative done to the economy? Oh, it's done a, it's, it's been devastating. I mean, we still don't know the full impact of it because the U.S. economy is on economic life support right now, you know. Um, but it's going to be devastating. I mean, pe- the study of economics is a study of human behavior. I mean, is there a good chance this, uh, this, um, COVID-19 has changed a lot of human behavior in, uh, permanent ways that are going to have to make things readjust? One hundred percent, absolutely. I mean, I'm just thinking. I'm a huge sports fan and a former sports director. You know, not being in a stadium cheering on a team doing something for me is totally foreign. (laughs) And and, but will I feel comfortable going back to one? How important is the November third election for the markets and the economy? Well, I can't. I can't say for the stock market. what, What I think actually. Actually, I, I don't think it matters whatsoever because I think we're going down a long road of, of decline that's going to take that's going to take more more years than most people imagine to get back to whatever's the new normal. That's how, and, and I'm saying that because I believe that's what the what that's what the devastation is going to turn out to be. I think at least you know 10 to 20 percent of all small businesses will ultimately go out of business, and that's huge. I mean, what are those guys going to do? You know, 70% of all employment in the United States, I mean, uh, somewhere around that number, it's a, it's a, it's a big number, um, comes from small business. You know, it's not the, the big 3M corporations, because I mean, there's so many of them. And, you know, I walk around town, you walk around, I don't know if you see it, out down here in Southern California, lots, lots of businesses have, have gone out of business. And, and even the ones that are, that are still in business, open for business, you wonder how many of them are paying rent. Because a lot of them aren't. It's the only way they can stay in business. It's the only way, they can't pay rent and operate at a 50% uh, cash flow level. I mean, you know, like most of those retail businesses and, and restaurants, you know, their, their profit margins are somewhere in the 10 to 15% range and 15% for a restaurant if you, if you sell alcohol. Not much of that's being sold lately. One of the good things here, Bob, in British Columbia, they're allowing you to buy alcohol with your takeout meal. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> so when they sell you a bottle of a bottle of vodka and you can just, you know, unscrew the cap on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you can get uh, a very nice uh, wine to go with your steak dinner. Would you be surprised to see rising interest rates in the near future? Um, no, I wouldn't be surprised, but the long-term interest rates, not the short-term interest rates. I could see, I could see mortgage rates start going up and up and up and going back to somewhere, you know, off of a hundred-year record low. And, um, I could see that short-term rates that yesterday, uh, uh, Fed Chairman, uh, Jay Powell said the Fed's committed to leaving interest rates right where they are. Uh, until 2023, which is another three years. So, yes, they have the ability to do that. They can control the short end of the curve, but they can't control the long end. Could we see a rally in the U.S. dollar? 
We could. I think. I think we could only because it's so. It, it's relatively oversold right now. I mean, and, and the. Um, but also, I could see it going down. I wouldn't speculate on the U.S. dollar. I mean, that's not where I'm going to put put my money. I mean, even though because even though I'm a big proponent of gold, as you know, and have been uh, have advised a lot of people that that's going to be the best performing asset in, during the next, you know, three to five years. And I was I was saying that two years ago. The um, but the, the correlation between gold and the U.S. dollar, even though it can be very tight at times, it can be very loose at times too. Are gold, silver, and Bitcoin safe haven assets? Yeah, I think they are. I don't know about Bitcoin. I'm, I'm I have you know um, no expertise in that area. The but gold and silver, I, like I said, I I think it's going to be the the best investment to own. You know, for the next uh, you know next three to five years. In fact, my strategy is is, you know, hold on to the gold while the gold goes up and real estate cycles down, particularly here in, in California, which is very cyclical. And then at the bottom of the cycle, sell half my, half my gold and buy a, a, a high-end fixer-upper and ride the cycle up while I create value doing that and having the time of my life. We're hearing of possible food shortages and rising prices for food. What are you hearing? Well, I, I'm seeing that. I haven't shopped in 10 years. I mean, my wife's the cook. The, um, but I, I know what the prices of some of this stuff is doing, and I think that's going to be the, the next, uh, could, could likely be the next big shock to the system is rising food prices. And why, and that's because of shortages. I mean, the, you know, uh, transportation shortages and disruptions and things like that. I'm reading, I don't read much about China because I don't believe the thing, but that some people I do read said that there's a, that, that, that uh, China is hurting for food. That you know that there's that you know there's shortages over there. See, and what's 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 really um, uh, could potentially devastating about that is everybody eats food. Everybody eats food, Jim. Rich people and poor people. So who's it going to impact the most proportionately? The poor people. I mean, and that's so that Christ, the poor people in the United States are doing bad enough without all of a sudden increasing the price of food. I mean, that's just one more spark that's going to be on the potential bonfire that's going to go up. As food prices rise, as you mentioned, uh, will it be tougher for some people to afford higher quality food? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to, I think it's going to get harder for the average. The average family in the United States is living month to month. And over 50% of all families can't cover a $500 emergency expense. That shows you how close they are close they are to the uh, to the edge and that's why all this enhanced employment um, unemployment benefits that are being handed out has and to these people that don't have jobs the unemployed that's pure life support when that ends those guys are going to get hurt real badly and with and 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 most of the most of the lower end you know people, wages the retail the hospitality they're all making you know 12 to 15 dollars an hour you know what they they can't afford rent, and all of a sudden all these rentals are going to be are going to be you know uh, up. So it's really going to impact the lower end more than it is the higher end. But I mean that there can be some devastating uh, potential consequences that that you don't have to make a lot of crazy stuff up to see where yeah I can see that happening. <laughs> Is intermittent fasting a way for people to improve their health and save money at the same time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that as you and maybe, maybe um, our listeners know that have heard me before, health, health has uh, always been my number one investment. I'm, I'm 73 years old. I grew up in a family that emphasized health. My mom and dad were always healthy. I've always been healthy. And um, one of the things, even as I get older, you know, I'm the, uh, you know, my goal is to be the, the youngest looking 73 year old in Southern California. And all my friends tell me, you already are. I said, but it's, it's still not meeting my standards, but intermittent fasting, as far as, keep, you gotta keep your weight down, everybody. You gotta keep, you gotta stay lean and muscular, and the way that's done is with diet. You can, you can lift weight to be the strongest guy in the world and be overweight. So you do it with diet, you gotta eat a low carb, high fat, High fat diet, and you have to get into fasting. Losing weight gets harder and harder, especially as you get older, because your metabolism slows down. So I fast uh, 14 to 16 hours a day, a minimum of three to four times a week. 
and I, I eat well. I don't eat sugars and breads and that kind of thing. And at my and uh, am I in good shape? Yes. Is it hard to lose weight from this level? Yes. And I want to lose another five pounds to get even even more perfect. But you have to fast, guys. That's the best way to lose weight. You know, and I mean, you know, pr- promote that into your diet. It's been scientifically proven, and it's you know, the, uh, the the calories in, calories out doesn't work. Dieting doesn't work. It's it's diet and exercise. And the and the I bet you uh, of all the econ books I have in my business library, I bet you uh, the I have like twenty uh, percent that many on health, diet, and exercise. So, I mean, I am committed to getting to the truth, which is uh, not always easy in the health business. Right, Jim? <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if you... Everybody's got the latest formula for losing weight without without having to work out or change your diet, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll see like a lot of those ads on TV. I'm glad I have a big screen TV. I can read the fine print. Not approved by the government. <laughs> Yeah, this hardly this hardly ever works, but once in a while it does, and I'm showing a picture of it on the TV right now. <laughs> yeah. Could a lack of food lead to civil unrest? Yes, absolutely. We're only three meals away from from um, a revolution, and um, I think we're getting close to civil unrest anyway. It wouldn't surprise me that one of your one of your guests you have on your show is Martin Armstrong, and I follow him, you know, very closely. I even uh, I'm a subscriber to his to his, um, his, his investment newsletter that isn't available, you know, to the general public for free in order to keep the riffraff it out. But, uh, he thinks, he thinks the U- U.S. could, could divide up, be divided up into individual states, um, by, um, uh, 2032. And, and you know what? You look back in history, you look back in history, Jim. I mean, Russia divided up, Yugoslavia divided up. Uh, gee, would this be the first time that that couldn't possibly ever happen? Anything can happen. Just study history, and you go back and go, wow. So, I mean, he thinks, because look at the dissent. This country has never, ever been more divided. I went through the, the Vietnam, you know, so-called protests and things like that. There are nothing like this. I was going to college during that time. That was the Vietnam year. You know, that's when I joined the Air Force. It's nothing like this. This is pure hate. People, nobody was running around with guns shooting each other. I mean, God help us how this thing's going to turn out. And you know what? And whoever wins the U.S. election, it's not going to change a thing. In fact, it's just to me, it's going to accelerate the um, uh, the path towards uh, the civil war. Get ready, guys. You can't be too safe about this about stuff like this. You got to you, you know, it's better to panic early than panic late. <laughs> There's a large number of people on temporary government assistance. What happens when that runs out? Exactly. That's what we all want to know. I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'll tell you exactly with 100% certainty what's going to happen when that money runs out, Jim. They're not going to have as much money. (laughs) 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 So where do we go from how how that all plays out? Um, it's it, it's going to be broad, but it, that could change a lot of things too. There's a push for universal basic income. Would that be a disincentive to work, and how would that affect the economy? Wow, would it be a super disincentive to work? And and you know, just study socialism. And does, does, does socialism ever lead to a rising standard of living? No, it leads to a a, a lowering of the standard of living. So it's no, it's that's we're moving in the wrong direction with that. Now I'm of a big belief that they should up the personal exemption before you have to start paying tax. Would that be a better way to stimulate the economy? Well, you know, there's there's arguments I've read that I mean, that I, I I like that idea. You know, personal income tax. There's ways to avoid that. And, and which would be which would be a net positive to the U.S. economy. I'm not sure how all the details of that would work out, but once you get into these, you know, the, the less complicated you make things, Jim, generally the more productive the the system is. Now you add a tax. You buy a car, you got to pay. It's not you know the sales tax. It's it's three times that much, or something. And and the, and. The, it goes to the government. It works. It works that way better because it, it simplifies things. 
And you know, most, and look, you know what most, see, in, in other words, it takes politics out of it too. Do you think these, these tax laws and all this other things are designed for poor people or rich people? Who, who runs the lobbies, the poor people or the rich people? We'll have more with Robert Campbell right after the break. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Robert Campbell. Bob, a number of people now are working at home. What are the pros and cons of having your workers work from home? I think, you know, I think that there's, there's, there's positives and negatives of doing that. However, from a business standpoint, from a profit and loss standpoint, I think it's clearly a net positive. Because, I mean, you can, you can give up expensive office space. All of a sudden, the, um, the employee doesn't have to commute. And maybe he can come into the office once or twice a week and stay with his sister or whatever. I mean, to do something like that. But I think the net positive of it, I think that's a net positive. Now, the net negative, of course, especially for us, you know, so, humans are social animals. You can get isolated and get depressed and that kind of thing. I don't know how to overcome that. But from a, from a dollars and cents standpoint, I think it's a, it's a net positive for both employees and the company and the shareholders. As if there's any price discovery, as if value matters anymore anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, you see, I'm lucky, Robert. I've been working from home for the last 10 years, but I get to talk to some of the most intelligent people on the planet doing right. this, uh, people like you. You have, see, see, look, yeah, I'm not worried about guys like you. I work at home, too, but I don't get to talk all day with smart guys like you. I mean, maybe I get one call a day or something like that. You know, my subscribers are all smart people. We all know each other and stuff like that. We have intelligent conversations. And maybe not even one a day. Maybe only, you know, two or three a week. That's, that's why I got to get out. That's why I miss going to the gym. Hey, that's, that's my social scene, you know? I mean, when I get to lift weights and I get to look with, uh, you know, talk with cute young girls that are in great shape. Are rents a canary in the coal mine for real estate? I, I believe they are. Because about once they end this enhanced unemployment, and let's say we lose twenty um, percent of all small business jobs, twenty um, percent you know total employment, all these guys are going to start moving home, and they're going to leave their apartment because they don't have a job, they can't pay the rent, and and they're all going to move home. Interestingly, Pew just did a survey, and this is in the U.S. People between the ages of twenty and thirty years old. Fifty-two percent are now living at home in the United States right now. That beat that beat a record going back to 1900 during the 1930s Great Depression. It got to 51. So I mean, that, if that gives you some perspective, how bad a shape the economy is in right now, uh, there's one other example. How popular are deferred mortgages? I have no idea about those. I don't. I don't know what the volume is. Oh, oh, I mean, oh, defer, you're talking about deferring mortgages like the forbearance program? Yes. Yeah, well, I think there's 4 million Americans that, uh, um, mortgage debtors, um, people that own homeowners that have a mortgage on their house are, 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 um, in forbearance, and 75% of them have, have had to extend the forbearance. So, all of a sudden, let's say you're talking about, uh, 3 million people. Once this forbearance program ends, do I think those guys that are, that are, that are out that haven't paid in a year are going to be able to start, uh, paying their mortgage payment on time? No. I think a high percentage of them are going to have to put their house on the market. They've all got equity because, you know, a lot of them have equity. They can put it on the market. But here's where the dynamics of the current marketplace change. Real estate's still super hot here in the United States in general. It's being driven by low supply. All of a sudden, all these people that you didn't, ha- you know, you don't have to pay rent, you don't have to pay your mortgage, you don't have to do this and all that kind of stuff, when that ends and we get back to more of a real-world situation, there could be a ton of houses, you know, hit the market in inventory. And that whole supply-demand dynamic could change significantly where there's not a shortage. Now there's a huge surplus. And you know what that does to prices? It drives them down. And that could could start the downward cycle that's going to persist for, you know, um, 
you know, in, in houses years and years and years until we get back to some kind of equilibrium. Uh, what is so that? I think housing is, is very expensive right now. Is it still going up? Yes. I mean, the, I follow California because um, um, the majority of my subscribers are there, even though, you know, everybody all, you know, that tracks 17 cities <clears throat> all over the United States, major cities. The, um, but California, the weakest housing market, in, 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 major housing market in the United States right now, folks, is San Francisco, California. San Francisco, that had the biggest run-up during the boom, and now it hasn't gone down. It's maybe, it's up, in the last year and a half, San Francisco real estate's gone up like 1%. So in other words, it's hanging on the edge. Everything else in the United States, is, in the States, is going up, you know, five or six. And, you know, Phoenix is a hot market. Um, that's going up, you know, I don't think anything's going up double-digit anymore. But San Francisco is the weakest, and I think that's going to be the epicenter of the of the of the crash for all California. Could we be in for a real estate collapse like two thousand and nine or worse? Oh, of course. I mean, we have the potential for that. You can't say in advance, you know. And and everybody said, oh, that can never happen because there were all these easy mortgages people could get with no money down and no payment. Right. We we those things aren't made anymore. This is a whole different set of circumstances. Unemployment could be high. Wages could be falling. Commercial real estate could collapse because of the collapse in demand. So it might be a whole new set of dynamics because no two cycles are ever the same, Jim. I mean, you just can't look at the last one and say, oh, well, these conditions don't exist today, so that means we're okay. That's pure BS. I mean, every cycle is a little different. You have to adjust to it. So this one may be driven by by persistently high unemployment. Is the coronavirus scare likely to cause people to make permanent lifestyle changes? I think only if you're crazy, or maybe um, maybe people have 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 panicked and all of a sudden moved out of downtown San Francisco, you know, out to Central California or something like that, and go and only gone, you know. Living in the country isn't that bad. <laughs> Especially coming out of a, out of a, out of San Francisco. I don't know. Have you been in San Francisco in the last five years? No, I haven't. Oh, believe me, that place has gone downhill. I mean, it, I mean, it's, as far as the, the, the cleanliness, the quality, the, 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 the homelessness and all of that. It's a beautiful city, but boy, has it, has it been poorly run? Yeah, Vancouver's had the same thing. It's uh, homeless people peeing and pooping everywhere. Drug addicts. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, hey, do you have, it's Starbucks here in the United States. Some of the Starbucks used to have um, needle dispensaries. We could walk into Starbucks and, and put your used needle in it so that you, you wouldn't have to put it in a trash can or just, or just you know, throw it in the street. You guys have those things up there? Uh, no, I think they're just throwing them in the street. <laughs> but it's a good idea to have a sharps container, I think, anywhere. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I think it's good for business. It, it brings people in. I, you know, <laughs> and, and good for business. Isn't that the kind of consumer you're looking for? Somebody that's hooked on super meth or something? Yeah, but who needs coffee if you're on meth? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What's the latest right. on the California real estate market? Are people still leaving the state? Yeah, they are. We have we have uh, net out migration, and I think the, the, there's only three other states in, or, or major uh, states uh, uh, that are doing that. And I think it, the other two are New York and Illinois. But no, the people are leaving. But the prices are still holding their own, and even and even you know going up in most instances. So my question is this: Everybody's leaving. For every seller, there's a buyer. I'm selling my price at a high price in San Francisco, and I'm moving to Kansas City where I can replace that house for one third the cost, and I can have you know a million dollars in the bank to live. Okay, somebody still had to buy that that house from me. Who's buying it? That's my question. With lower mortgage rates, we're hearing people are refinancing their mortgages. Would this explain the increase in auto sales and retail sales? Well, you know, it could increase it from the standpoint of this. It's, people aren't doing cash-out refis that were the rage during the, you know, the last real estate bubble. They're not doing that. There's a little bit, but they're not doing that. People learned their lesson. But here's, here's where you're... you're it could be have a positive uh, effect on consumer uh, purchases. All of a sudden, you lower the mortgage, especially here in California. You refinance your house for a point less, 
and your mortgage payment goes down by $500 a month. Now you have $500 a month more. Do most people put that in the bank? No, they spend it. So that it, 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 it'll get happen kind of indirectly. They're not they're not refinancing their mortgage from from six hundred thousand to seven hundred thousand dollars and buying a new Porsche. They, people aren't doing that. Bob, do you have any uh, good health tips for us? Yeah, the the, the people that have been listening to us this far, they know how important health is to me. All I can tell you is, guys, you got to start early, and it has to develop into a habit. That you know, staying healthy long term that pays no investment pays higher dividends than that. It positively impacts every single aspect of your life, and for you guys, that includes the number of women that look more women that look at you. But you gotta stay, you gotta stay lean. Us guys, we gotta, you gotta keep our muscles strong. We gotta work out with weights. I run hills for my lower body, and it's diet. Weight is controlled by diet. You can't eat sugar. You got to go low carb. You just can't. You got to do that. And if you do all those things, you can be in great shape. Is it a lot of work? It's a ton of work. It's a ton of work. People look at me and they go, "Oh, I bet you're just naturally in good shape." And I look at them and go, <laughs> "You must be crazy." I have to work on it 24 hours a day, just like you and everybody else. And so you have to be conscious of it and just develop good habits. And I've always been attracted. I've always liked the girls. And so I found out that the better shape I am, the better shape I keep myself in, more women look at me. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating one bit. Even though I'm taken and I'm the most faithful guy in the world, I still like it when, when women check you out, especially when they're like 30 years younger and they go, wow, that guy's, that guy's in great shape. Yeah, flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> hey, isn't that, how, how junior high juvenile is that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any investment wisdom for us? Yes, I would. Let's finish up with this where I think what I, I told you where I think gold's gonna go. The gold's gonna be the premier investment and silver will probably tag along. But for those of you that want a little more diversified portfolio, I think commodities is gonna do really, really well. I've, I've looked at the long term charts. Uh, commodity trends tend to be very cyclical and one chart I looked at, it passed a certain threshold where it was, where it was over 10% uh, off the, off the recent bottom. And you go back a uh, uh, hundred years, and you look at the commodity cycles. And every time the prices have risen ten percent above the commodity, above that uh, the old low, things have taken off either to a moderate or to a strong degree. So I think commodities. So I think commodities is going to be a real good investment over the course of at least the next year, maybe two or longer. How can people find your book and sign up for your newsletter? Okay, I wrote the book Timing the Real Estate Market. I, I tell everybody exactly how I do it. I don't, I don't, I, I share my formulas with people. Uh, and uh, you can buy that book on my website, realestatetiming.com, realestatetiming.com. And also you can, uh, you can get the book free if you subscribe one year to my um, real estate timing letter. That's one of my investment choices. So um, the, the book is really good. <laughs> I, I, I wrote it, I, I wrote it um, uh, in 2002. It, uh, people said, how many times have you changed the formula? And I said, the, mo- the, the formula and changed the model. Zero. I tested it before, and it worked then, and it works now, and it's probably going to keep working forever and ever. I mean, I wouldn't bet against it, that's for sure. So you, you can learn about what I do, and um, um, if you're interested in real estate, real estate cycles, the golden rule of investing, guys, is, is buying low and selling high. I don't care what, else, what they say about anything, cash flow, no. The golden rule is buy low, sell high. You do that for your whole life, you'll do, you'll do really well in the market. Bob, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Jim, it's a pleasure. Always is. Talk to you later. My guest has been Robert Campbell, publisher of the realestatetiming.com newsletter. He was speaking to us from San Diego. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Bob Hoy, and Robert Campbell, And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for our guests or the show, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for company showcase updates from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray and Golden Arrow Resources Vice President Brian McEwen. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more 
This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Thanks, Jim. Larry, your public relations department, which I suspect is you, has been cranking out the news releases this past week. What's in them? Well, we had a couple of releases. The first one was on Monday, and uh, that was to do with a private placement uh, that so the company can get moving on with the completion of its uh, of its pilot plant optimization and uh, start moving forward on the uh, the uh, actual design and uh, estimations on the uh, the uh, commercial plant. So you know that's uh, I have to say that placement's going well. It looks like uh, you know it's uh, well over well. Uh, let's let's just say that it's at uh, sixty to seventy percent done. So uh, that's looking really good. And uh, and we also had a release uh, later on, Jim, with uh, to do with the manganese project. And I thought it was worth mentioning because a lot of the manganese stocks are getting active. And uh, we were the first ones to ever uh, pioneer the mining here on this side of the world, and uh, you know, for in North America anyway. And uh, we had a uh, low-grade deposit that uh, that we had to do a lot of a uh, lot of R and D on, and uh, and to patent the process that eventually became our recycling uh, cornerstone. But that process uh, allowed us to uh, compete uh, with low-grade deposits with the cost of Chinese deposits in the production of electrolytic manganese metal. And uh, what I want to tell everybody is, basically, we spent between 20 and $25 million uh, getting to that point. Uh, I mean, we, uh, you know, we drilled off resources. We uh, basically uh, did uh, all the R&D work with Cometco. And uh, we uh, hired Tetra Tech uh, to do a pre-feasibility study. So, uh, as you can see, we were moving the project ahead from the time we picked it up till, uh, 2011 when we started the, uh, pre-fees, which was completed, uh, about a year later in 2012. And by that time, the price of manganese had gone down, as well as the entire venture exchange had gone into the ash can. And, uh, but it was, it wasn't that that stopped us. It was the, uh, it was the price of uh, manganese that went below, or not below, but uh, it was uh, at a price that would take 11 years to repay that, uh, that mine, which was estimated to cost about $480 million. So I did some work back in 2013. Uh, we did very little work on the other side of the equation on the electrolytic metals, and that was the manganese dioxide, which is used in your EV cars. And, uh, in, well, actually in lithium ion batteries. So, uh, we did some work on that. Uh, Cometco, uh, ran the material from the mine through the, uh, pilot plant and, uh, we got, uh, results of high purity. And, uh, they actually made, uh, what we call, uh, button cells or, uh, you know, just a cell that, uh, that you can measure the, uh, measure to find out whether it's a working battery, and uh, we we were successful in doing that. So based on that, uh, I did some, you know, work in the office, which is pretty simple. The uh, manganese metal, if you uh, take, you, you have to mine 100% of the manganese to get the manganese out and get good recoveries and uh, everything else, so your, uh, your pit size is... Uh, and your uh, operation size is uh, based on, uh, you know, mining uh, total metal, total uh, ore to make, to make the metal. Whereas in uh, dioxide, 
it's made up of uh, 60% manganese and 40% oxygen, and uh, so you have uh, you have a different set of tools to work with. And then, you know, basically your whole footprint goes down by uh, 40%, uh, which would affect the OPEX and operating co- costs. Um, the uh, In, in uh, making metal, you've got a huge circuit of, uh, of electroplating cells. And uh, in the case of uh, electric manganese metal, you only need 15% of those circuits to make the uh, electric manganese dioxide, I should say. To make the metal, so that really, uh, you know, skews the, uh, the, uh, OPEX and the, uh, CAPEX in, uh, in a direction that is a lot more palatable and probably if we'd have done the tests on, uh, dioxide instead of metal, but at that time metal, when we started all this, metal was at a good price and, uh, it, it eroded, uh, thanks to the Chinese because they were all started they all started overproducing as usual, which, which they've done with lithium. And, uh, you know, the basic thing is that, uh, uh, we kind of lost sight of that. I think a lot of our investors, except for some of the, uh, well, a lot of the uh, our investor base is still uh, made up of people who have been with us for over 10 years. And, uh, so the, uh, we, we just want to remind people that, hey, we got a, a project down there. That uh, is not only great for making lithium-ion batteries, but just for the uh, product itself. Uh, it's used in uh, in uh, ductability of steel, about uh, you know 10 pounds to 20 pounds of uh, manganese goes into every ton of steel, which gives it a ductability. If you didn't have it, you would have a you'd make a plate of steel that, if you dropped it on the concrete floor, would shatter like glass. And uh, and there's no substitution for that. They tried to substitute that for years, but there's no known substitution for that. And that metal, is, uh, as you can well expect, is, uh, you know, high demand for infrastructure, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, all of those things in the U.S., and they have no production of manganese. So that opens another window. That doesn't mean that we're going to divert the uh, attention from the pilot plant, which, by the way, is still uh, working along now, and uh, I'll have to check, check touch base with uh, Norm to see if we can get an update on that. You know, we're still optimizing on that, and, and I just want to mention that the optimization is a really uh, smart way to go. I mean, uh, it, it shows up weaknesses that you have in the plant, Areas that could be uh, get corroded, uh, areas that are restricted, uh, pumps that are that you have to increase the size, impellers, uh, tanks, you name it. And uh, so the, uh, the optimization is necessary to get the final design done. And we hope from this final, final uh, this financing that we're doing that we'll be able to get that design done. And then we're talking a whole different. Uh, a whole different realm, and that realm is, uh, you know, now we can show a uh, independent uh, feasibility study on it, and uh, money should be a lot easier to get. So we've been busy, and, uh, you know, the spin-out is going along well. The, uh, basically, uh, we've got uh, guys that are, a guy that's working on the uh, 43101. They've had their property visit. They're starting to turn out, uh, you know, some of the maps that are required and everything else for the uh, 43101. So, uh, and don't forget that that property had, uh, you know, a production for three or four years, a small mine, mind you, of uh, 6% copper and just under 0.1 ounces of gold. And it actually had shipments off there from other areas of the mine that ran up to 6 ounces of gold. So, it uh, it's a great property. It's a great uh, uh, IPO uh, property for you know. There's no better place to look for a mine than where there's an ex- where there has been an existing mine. So uh, you know everything is uh, turning up roses for us. I know that uh, everybody's PO'd because I had to raise money, but I'm not the only company out there. Every company on the on the board has to raise money at various times to drill or to uh, move their project along or get their feasibility started. And, uh, it, you know, so it's 
just a, a uh, necessary situation that you have with the junior company. And, uh, you know, for all the dilution that we've taken, we have replaced that with some stellar results, and uh, that'll that'll all crystallize with the uh, investors at some point going forward. So anyway, Jim, it's uh, it's a good way to end the week, and uh, I think that we're uh, we're on to bigger and better th- things. Uh, well, one thing that I've included in there is a, a June 24th or, uh, article from uh, Ar- Argoni where they're talking about. Uh, the uh, manganese that they've been uh, doing a lot of research on uh, for for the uh, lithium ion batteries, and uh, I see that as uh, a push that's coming in another direction to re- reduce the cost of the electric batteries. So we got both sides covered on that with our recycling and with our uh, with our deposit in Arizona. So. Uh, Maybe we can get back to the day where people will start talking about us as the uh, one of the manganese companies that are is, is starting to grow out there. Larry, for people new to American Manganese, what's the company all about? Well, the company is a critical metal company, and uh, we've, uh, as I mentioned, we've developed the process that uh, to uh, actually produce uh, electric manganese metal or dioxide. And, uh, which is comparative to costs in China. And, uh, you know, which is, goes a long ways. So, and we've taken that uh, technology and morphed it into a technology for recycling batteries. And that's our cornerstone of our, uh, current, uh, patents that we hold in our, uh, in our, uh, battery recycling operation. So, uh, the, uh, you can go to the website and you can find out all you want about what's the progress in. We're very transparent. Uh, every, every bit of work and research is done by arm's length group called Cometco. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they're the best, uh, the best, uh, research company out there. And, uh, you know, the, uh, you can reach us or, we're traded on the Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY. We're traded in uh, in the U.S. under the symbol AMYZF, and we're traded in Frankfurt under the symbol 2AM. You can always reach us at the company here at uh, L-R-E-A-U-G-H at A-M-Y-M-N dot com, or give us a call at 778-574-4444. Larry, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. My guest has been Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on September 18th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Brian McEwen, Vice President of Exploration and Development for Golden Arrow Resources. Welcome back to the show, Brian. Hi, Jim. Nice to be here. Brian, what's new at Golden Arrow? Oh, Golden Arrow. Well, we're, we're, right now we're negotiating the, the shutdown. We're continuing to do that. So that's been a, a, a bit of a challenge. And, um, as per the news release we put out this week, or, you know, we, uh, we are making some advances in, in all of the countries we're working at. We're, uh, we've started drilling in our project in, in Paraguay and, and that's going, going well. Hopefully we'll have some results out in that within the next few weeks. Uh, and we're doing a bunch of surface work on our project in, in Chile on the Rosales project. And uh, we should have some more results for that coming up. Um, and in uh, um, Argentina, they're shut down pretty tight there, but we're still able to get out and do a little bit of prospecting. So we've got, um, you know, we've got lots going on, um, as well as we're still considering a bunch of different projects for, for M&A and acquisitions. Uh, so we're, we're keeping really busy right now. Brian, for people who are new to Golden Arrow, just how big and widespread is the company? Yeah, the Gold, Golden Arrows is part of the Grosso Group. It's been working mostly in Argentina for the last 27 years. The company's had a lot of success there. There's, uh, it's got four discoveries to its, its, its name. 
the Guacamayo project, the um, Navidad project, and then we the project we recently monetized with uh, SSR Mining Chinchillas. And then our sister company, um, Blue Sky Uranium, uh, has a discovery uh, in Rio Negro province. So we've been working there continually, had, had successes. Uh, our last one that we had I mentioned was Chinchillas, was a, um, a project that we had developed, a mine and developed in, in Huhui province with uh, SSR Mining. It was Silver Standard at the time. Uh, we were able to monetize that, and um, the last quarter of the of the project was sold uh, in shares, the deal was made mostly a share deal and some cash. It worked out to about forty-four million dollars for us at the time. Um, that was as that was a, 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 sh- a share deal. Those shares have gone up by about thirty cents. So during the pandemic, we've been very fortunate to be able to leverage those those shares and make about uh, ten or eleven million dollars just uh, just by by having those shares. Um, those have not been exercised. We're still holding those. I think I think right now the company has about. Uh, about 29 million in uh, cash and cash equivalents. Uh, so no, we're 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 sitting pretty well right now. I have to say. What else is the the company involved in, or is it just purely mining? Well, we're 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 not in mining. We're in exploration. Um, we were looking at some some more advanced projects. Uh, we're well well well. Um, well staffed in, in a project in Mendoza, and that actually ends up being a very good center for working in in, um, in that part of Latin America. So we're, you know, we threw out the net a little further, and now we're in in Chile as well as in uh, um, Paraguay and in, in Argentina, and, and we've got the money from the the deal that we did with SSS Mar- our mining. So we're we're well financed, and uh, you know things are despite having the challenges with uh, with COVID, where we are are moving ahead. Where is Golden Arrow traded? It's traded uh, in, on the TSX Venture Exchange under GRG. It's traded in in Frankfurt, EGA, I think it is, if, if anybody's trading in Frankfurt. And then it was just traded over in the OTC in the U.S. If people need more information about old Golden Arrow, where should they go? Uh, the Golden Arrow, our, our, our web page is a good place to start, or you can call our, our head office and talk to, uh, to Sean, Sean Perger. He's always... Always willing to talk to anybody and, and give the story. Uh, that would probably be a good a good place as well. And the phone number's on the website? Yes, it is. 604-687-1828. That's our, our main line. And you just, you know, navigate the machine. It'll take you to Sean. Brian, thank you so much for the update. My, my pleasure, Jim. My guest has been Brian McEwen, Vice President of Exploration and Development for Golden Arrow Resources. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on September 15th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.